the interaction between them is what is what l sets the stage for the existence of coronal mass ejections and so on and so forth. So if you have a cycle where active regions, a number of active regions is changing with time, you can, I mean, it follows immediately that the amount of violent releases of energy also changes with time, okay? Now, the presence and emergence of this evolution of these active regions also has a very strong impact on the shape and connectivity of the solar corona. Uh, and here are two eclipses taken during solar maximum and solar minimum. And so, who thinks the right one is solar minimum? And who thinks the left one is solar minimum? And who is uncertain? <laughs> okay, so I wanted to just also part of this exercise is to show you how that no matter whether you're at maximum or minimum, you still never achieve a perfect, super simple solution. And this is to a great extent because cycles overlap. Right? When one cycle is dying, the other one is all generally already starting. So you never reach that. It's very hard. The sun very rarely reaches that state of peace and calm and understanding of the universe that, right? Because there is always something always going on. This is solar minimum and this is solar maximum. One thing that, that you can use to tell when solar minimum is and solar maximum is, is the poles, right? If you have a very clear open field lines at the poles, right, marked in the corona, you're, and you can see it very clearly, you're, you're general, you can safely assume you're looking at solar minimum, right? When you're at solar maximum, there is so much stuff going on that it basically, di and the dipolar, there is, a, there is a lot of stuff going on at the poles that produces cancellation and, and makes the field close down, so no longer opens up. And so you don't see, so this is basically one of the telltale signs that you're at minimum versus maximum. Now, one thing that you can clearly see between minimum and maximum is the percentage of the solar disk that is filled by open lines, right? Versus the one that is filled up by close, not fully, this kind of this closed cusps, right? These are called Helmert streamers, right? This is going to also change very significantly the, the conditions on the heliosphere. So why? I'm going to make this introduction just, you're going to go into much more detail of this later. Solar winds are determined by this they have these like structures. And you can have essentially two kinds, very distinct kinds of solar wind. When you have open lines, solar wind is fast. So what you're looking at here is the Ulysses instrument. This is a spacecraft that went into a polar orbit around the sun. It measured the properties of the solar wind in situ, wherever it was. This orbit took about three years. Right? It happened at the minimum of cycle 22. So in the background, you have just a typical coronal configuration for solar minimum with dark, open lines at the poles and these streamers at the equator, right? What you can see, the distance from the center of this image tells you how fast the solar wind was at when Ulysses was at that latitude, right? You can see that when you're above the polar holes, solar wind is fast. And when you hit low latitudes, solar wind is slow, right? The other thing that you can see here in color is the direction of the magnetic field, whether it's into the sun in blue or out of the sun in red, right? So you have a very clear division between the northern and southern hemisphere, and this is this is a peaceful and calm heliosphere, like sun and heliosphere, right? When you look at things at maximum, the picture is extremely, is very different. You have a very 
the mixture of the two kinds of solar wind, you have mixture of polarities, so things that come, sometimes come back down uh, to the sun, and so it's a very different, it's a very, very different kind of environment, right? And so that's, that's what makes the, the heliosphere have these seasons, right? And then when you go back to minimum, it's again peace and love, right? And this is where Ulysses died, unfortunately. Now, why, going back to the solar cycle, why this is important um, for, like, actually, why this helps us understand the cycle? Actually, let me put it this way. This is very important for anything that, if you care about the heliosphere at all, this is very important. Because this is the background upon which everything happens, right? Uh, but if you want to understand this cycle, this is also very important because there is this thing called, oh, and the magnetic field drags this around into these spirals, beautiful spirals that you saw in your simulations, right? But if this is a mess, the spiral is a mess. And if this is very nice and smooth, the spiral is nice and smooth. There is this thing called the galactic cosmic rays. This is, char this is the energetic particles that to a great extent come from outside the solar system. At low energies, these are charged particles. So these are particles that interact very strongly with the magnetic field. If your magnetic field is a mess, you end up with less cosmic rays inside the heliosphere. If the magnetic field is nice and smooth, we end up with more cosmic rays inside the, because trans transport is easier. Um, now, cosmic rays, when they heat our atmosphere, generate isotopes. So they change, they can change a neutron to a proton or something like that, and so you, you end up with a different kind of element, right? And these isotopes have long lives, and they get collected. Um, so that the two kind of isotopes that people used to study solar activity, the, the typical ones, are carbon-14, so that is, carbon-14 is generated by cosmic rays. Interaction of the cosmic rays with atmospheres. That gets settled down, and then um, plants and trees fix carbon, but they don't, uh, they, they fix carbon, uh, both 14 and, and the normal uh, carbon-12, I think it's 12, right? Uh, and so when you look at three rings, you measure the contents of, you can date, with three rings, you can date exactly uh, when a ring was formed, and then you measure the amount of carbon-14, and that tells you, as gives you a sense of, of how, what solar, what the heliosphere was doing, right? Because if, the, if we, you had a very quiet heliosphere, you're going to find a lot of carbon-14. If you have a very messy heliosphere, you're going to find less. Another one is beryllium-10. So beryllium-10 has a longer live life than carbon-14, and it gets deposited in snow, in the, it gets trapped by water, and, and it just gets deposited on the poles and glaciers. And so when you drill through a glacier and you look at the seasons, but now as layers in a glacier, you can measure carbon uh, beryllium-10 and also. Here is, um, the cosmic ray flux on Earth measured by two different instruments of, this is different energies, and the solar cycle. So you can see that when the solar cycle is at maximum, cosmic ray flux is at a minimum, and when the solar is, cycle is at minimum, cosmic ray flux is at a maximum. So this is kind of like uh, evidence of this. But then the nice thing is that even though we only have observations of the sol direct observations of the solar cycle during the last uh, 500 years, we have cosmic ray records that go way farther back. So this t takes me to the last uh, section of this talk, which is long-term cycle variability. What, has, what does the cycle do when you think about it in hundreds or thousands of years, right? So apart from the main one 11-year oscillation, there's, there is a larger variability in cycle amplitude. So you, you can kind of trace a line, right, that, that, does, that goes up, up, up and down. Um, now the strongest, weakest cycle has an amplitude of about, the strongest about 188 uh, sunspots. Mm. This is a smoothed sunspot number. I, I don't 
I don't want you to memorize this number. What I want you to compare is the strongest cycle is four times larger than the weakest cycle, basically, right? To a, to a great extent. But there is this period, oh, and the duration, mean, mean is 11, but, um, but the shortest is nine year and the longest is 14. This also depends on how you define the, exactly a solar cycle, because you have overlap between the wings, and so there is uh, some uncertainty there. But this is kind of like the general properties of the cycle. Now, of course, the most striking feature here is this part that you probably have heard about, the Maunder minimum, which is a period where there didn't seem to be many sunspots in the sun. And so this is just cycle 18 to 22, right? And this is kind of what we know the sun was doing during the Maunder minimum. So you see a very significant difference between these two. Uh, there is a very strong hemispheric asymmetry, right, between the two. And uh, there is, yeah, we didn't really see that many sunspots. And so one thing that I wanted to connect with the lab that you did is, okay, I have been telling you that the sun operates in a babcode layton mechanism, kind of. But what happens if you don't have active regions? There is no back collector mechanism. And so <clears throat> it's possible that during this time, what you had was the naked alpha omega dynamo going on, right? That was keeping the cycle ticking. And the cycle was keep, kept ticking. And we know that because with the um, kind of looking at cosmogenic isotopes and really massaging your data, you recover signals, the oscillating signals. So there, is, there seems to, so, Cosmic rays were still being modulated, but we didn't have many sunspots. So the cycle was still going on. So this is a, there is a lot of uncertainty here about exactly what was going on. Uh, very interesting period, and of course, people always like, like to speculate when will the next one will be, what will happen. There seems to be a connection with climate in Europe. So there is a coincidence between the Maunder minimum and a colder period in Europe. Uh, both measure temperatures, and if you look at paintings, there were people skating on Holland, right, in a river that never freezes today, right? So there, are, there is a lot of like uh, anecdotal evidence that it was colder in Europe, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the Earth was colder, because that's basically the only place where we have data now. All the data sets have been unearthed using, for, for example, stalagmites in India, right? So you see that the monsoons were changing, but not necessarily becoming colder, right? So, so it's more like a local climate change than a global climate change, in a sense, I feel. That's my feeling, the feeling that I currently have from looking at people talk and seeing the latest results, right? Um, <clears throat> so there is a very interesting scenario. The problem is that there was, prog there was a problem with our observations during the Maunder minimum. Our, our coverage was at first sight complete, but there was one uh, observatory that was very influential as defining the properties of the Maunder minimum, which is the Paris Observatory. And now we know that the Paris Observatory had some weird stuff going on. So there was a, it was a, there was a, a, a directive like the director of the observatory forbid people to report sunspot numbers. And so, because the, it was still under the whole, so the, sun's not perfect. the sun's not perfect kind of thing. Oh. So they wanted to avoid controversy, right? Until they figure out whether it was uh, a sin or not to look at the sun and say it has spots, let's just forget it, right? And so what you have is, you, what you have are reports that are years without a single sunspot measurement. But people in Germany that were not subject to this directive did drawings of the sun where there were sunspots. And so you say, OK, who, who do I believe? Of course, you believe the person who made the drawing, but he didn't make a drawing every day. So you have to kind of combine these things. And there is a person in Spain that has very, very nice work on this. It's actually an answer to the one that I told you. So it's like, so you should check it out. Now, the other uh, is that, of course, then you can you can 
use, calibrate cosmogenic activity with the current observations to guess what the solar cycle was doing in the past. So this is done for the last uh, thousand years. And you can go, so if you look at this and you trace a, a straight line saying, okay, everything below this is a grand minimum like the sun, like the grandmother minimum. In the last 1,200 years, we have had three grand minima. Uh, this is goes even farther back. Now, and, and so one thing that I want to caution you is there is the concept of the grand maxima, right? People talk about the present grand maximum, and I, I'm now uncertain that this is a, a real thing. Our data had an artificial inflation because of another director of the, of the keepers of the sunspot number had a director that changed the way people counted sunspots and basically never told anyone. And so now people have been revisiting and it seems that the modern grand maxima, which is what all the climate change deniers are using to blame the sun for the change, is artificial. And so this work was done where we, where we were convinced that grand maxima were like a real thing. So I'm not going to focus on the red things that are grand maxima. I'm going to, until we settle that, I'm going to focus only on the grand minima, which I do think are real things here. So here is a distribution. This is a very nice. This is a distribution of the days that you have, like uh, years with a specific sunspot number during the last 1,500 years in the front and during the last 10,000, 12,000 years in the back. The nice thing is that you find that uh, there is a, it seems like the last 1,500 years are representative of what the sun was doing during, during the last 12,000 years. Basically, this is what this result is telling you. Now, these people say, oh, there are deviations from normality and the low end and deviations of normality on the high end. So this is actually grand minima and this is actually grand maxima, but now I think that our data is wrong, so this thing is not necessarily here, and then, then perhaps what you have is a normal thing with a deviation for grand minima. In any case, um, like I tell you, don't, don't take the, the grand maxima as a given thing. Overall, if you focus on grand minima, the sun seems to spend one, one sixth of the time in a grand minimum period. So that's, uh, so why do we care? Grand minima and maxima poorly understood, so we, we want to understand what the solar cycle was doing during those times. Long-term solar changes are impossible to understand, are important to understand climate change, probably local climate change. Uh, and long-term proxies increases the data pool that we have to understand the solar cycle. So that's basically everything that I have for you today. I think we're perfectly in time to just go and eat lunch. <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions. I want to thank Andreas for a great morning. I, I really appreciate your help.